cares if we're working with out-of-date data? It'll only give us the wrong answer. In our previous lessons, we were starting to talk a little bit about these multi-core processors. Well, one of the ways that those multi-core processors are able to perform so well is that they have their own internal cache. Remember that the, the, the SMMP, excuse me, the SMP processor has this interconnection network. that connects each one of the processors with memory and I.O. Now, the idea is that we've got these memory locations, which we are going to communicate through in order to complete our process in parallel. So, for example, we talked a little bit about this idea of a two-dimensional map, heat map, where we could watch as time progressed how the heat distributed itself across that map by knowing boundaries of each one of the elements. Well, the boundaries between the region that processor one is working with and the processor two is working with, those boundaries have to be exchanged somehow. The data that's calculated by processor 2 has to be pass, passed to processor 1 and vice versa. Now, the problem we've got is that each one of these guys has its own cache, right? Now assume that we've got some sort of a memory location here. And let's say that A is equal to 10. Now, both processor B, excuse me, processor one and processor two, both bring A in. And so they have A is equal to 10 and A is equal to 10. Now, as long as they keep reading this value, that's not a problem. But what if processor one decides to change that value to five? and there's no mechanism for processor two to see that processor one has made that modification. We have to make that obvious. We have to update that to, we have to update that value to processor two. Otherwise, it's gonna be making the wrong decisions based on the value it's got. Now, there are a couple of ways that we could do this. The very first way, which is not the best way, is to have software our compiler and operating system handle the, the coordination of data values. Now, one of the ways that it does this is to make it so that these values that they're sharing are not cacheable. It is possible at, the, at, at certain levels to make it so that certain blocks of memory are not allowed to be brought into the cache. If the processor wants to access them, they have to go all the way out to main memory. Problem is that this is incredibly conservative and hurts performance because a lot of the time, you know, the vast majority of the time that we're using variables, we're reading them. Typically, we're not writing to them as much as we're reading from them. Well, each one of those reads is going to have to go all the way out to main memory, hurting performance. We could also make it so that certain values, certain variables are marked by the compiler as non-cacheable. And so there's actually going to be instructions inside of the code that say, we are not going to bring this into the cache. We have to go all the way out to main memory in order to access this value. All of those methods really, really hurt performance. Now, there's another method. And the other method is, there's actually two more methods. The second method is to have a big brother watching over all of the values as they keep coming in and out. This is referred to as a directory protocol. Now, a directory protocol, a lot like what it sounds, there's another processor that maintains a directory of exactly all the data values that are in memory that are being used by the different processors at any particular point in time. Now, that directory, it needs to be accessed by the processors. And the way it works is this. Let's say that I do have this controller. <laughs> 
If a processor wants to write to a value, it actually has to ask permission from the controller. The controller then tells all the other processors that have a copy of this value, and it knows because it's got a directory of who owns what and in what condition that var variable is. And it mentions, it tells all the other processors, hey, processor one is about to modify this value, so you have to invalidate your copy. And so it invalidates that copy, and it also makes a note that the value in memory is also going to be out of date. It then gives permission to that processor, okay, you can modify that value, but let me tell you, as soon as another processor wants that value, I'm gonna ask you to write that memory, that update that value in memory. So, another processor, let's say that processor three, wants to be able to modify or access that memory, not even necessarily modify. So the controller gets a request from processor three, says, I need that value. Processor one is told, you need to update memory. It passes the new value to memory. So memory is now updated, and now processor three can load that value. Now, if processor three decides that it needs to update the value, it goes ahead and it updates the value and now A equals three, this request, <laughs> skip a step there. Before it modifies it, it makes a request out to the controller and says, I need to modify this value. And then at that point, processor one is told to invalidate its value. So all of that has to pass through that controller. Now the problem with that is that this controller suddenly creates this central bottleneck, a bottleneck that allow, makes it so that every time we want to write, we have to pass through the controller and all this communication overhead is added in order to maintain consistency across all of our caches. Now there's a third way. Let me make some room on this board before we talk about that one. Now this third way is referred to as Snoopy protocols or sniffing. Now, the way that this works is that that responsibility that was on that central controller is now distributed across the cache mechanisms for each one of the processors. So now I've got multiple processors. Each one has a cache. And it's the job of the cache to watch what is going on with the interactions in memory by watching the other processors. So in this case, the caches need to watch not only their interaction with memory, but they have to watch the other processors' interactions with memory or the other caches' interactions with memory. Now, one method is something called write update. Now, in the case of write update, what happens is, is that if we've got, let's just go back to our A equals 10, and then both processors have their value of A in their own cache. Now, with write update, what happens is the updated word, whenever I have to do an update, processor one changes its value for A, it actually has to announce or broadcast its update to everybody. Now, everybody has an option now, and, and including, this goes back to the uh, main memory. Now, whenever the update is made, it broadcasts to the other caches, and the cache has the decision as to whether to reload or to access the new value or simply invalidate their value. Guess what? This creates an enormous amount of traffic because with every update to memory, there's going to be a broadcast of that message. There's another way called the messy protocol. Now in this case, we're also gonna be watching the bus, but there's a little bit more grace to it, let's say. Now the, the term messy comes from the four different states that each element in your cache can have. So if you've got an element or a value in your cache, it can either be M for modified, 
or E for exclusive, S for shared, or I for invalid. So let's go through the process to see what would happen as a program is first brought up and as the data starts getting populated inside of the L1 caches. The very first processor to load a piece of data loads it up as exclusive. So I'm the only processor that owns this bit of data and I can read it as much as I want nobody else gets affected. Now, there's one of two things that may happen. One thing that may happen is I get to write to this exclusive. I don't have to tell anybody that I'm writing to it. So if I write to this exclusive data, everybody knows I've done this, but now what happen, it happens is in my cache, this now becomes modified. I am still the only one that owns this piece of data. If, however, somebody else, a second processor, wants access to that data, well, it makes a request. It makes a request for that particular piece of data by going to the L2 cache. That request triggers the first processor, the one that owns this data as modified, and what it has to do is it has to write it back to memory. As soon as it writes it back, then the second processor that requested it also will load it. And in that case, we go to shared. All right. Now, once again, the very first processor to own it, it's exclusive. As soon as that processor writes to it, it becomes modified, nobody else owns it. And in fact, the value that's in main memory, probably out of date. That, in that case, if there's another processor that wants that data, it has to make a request for that data. In that case, the first processor writes it to memory so that the second processor can get that value too. Then both of those processors have the shared value. Now, the thing that's interesting about shared, after a while, things are churning along, you may throw a value out of the cache. There may be a value that you don't need anymore, so it gets replaced in the cache through one of the cache replacement algorithms. So shared doesn't necessarily mean that more than one device has it. It means that at one time, more than one processor had it, but other processors may have thrown it out. So you may have the, uh, a shared value that is still just in one cache. In that case, if you need to modify it, what happens is, is you say to the, to the other caches, I'm going to modify this value. It goes into modify. Now, if any other processors do happen to have a copy of it, which at one time they did because it was shared. So if one processor, the one that writes to it, goes to modified, everybody else goes to invalid. Why do they go to invalid? Well, they go to the invalid because they know that that value is no longer up to date. If they want to request the original, the, the processor that modified that value to write it back so that they can get a copy, that processor will write it back. You can load a new copy. It goes back to shared. And so you've got this process of watching, to, watching other caches and communicating with them your intentions to do things with certain pieces of data, and you have to modify your values. Now, how complicated is this? Well, if you look at a cache, remember when we talked about caches, I said that there were flags that identified the condition of the values inside of each line of the cache that contained a block. It only takes two bits in order to represent these four different conditions of our data. So modifying the values just simply changes the values for those particular bits in our data cache, giving us a good idea of whether or not we can use that data in order to compute our next values.